the Rebel Capitalist Show. I went back and looked at the data from the Spanish flu in 1918, and I noticed, ironically enough, that that really hit the United States in March, uh, pretty much the, the, the same month, but uh, a few years ago. <laughs> and I, then what happened is you get that first wave, the second wave in the fall, and then the spring, you get kind of a third wave. And then it really just fizzled out because people reached, uh, I guess we reached herd immunity in the United States. Obviously, there wasn't a, a vaccine back then. So I, I was thinking that, OK, we're on that same timeline now. Um, you know, if, if we didn't have this vaccine, would we have potentially just got up to herd immunity by that point anyway? And therefore, maybe the, the vaccine isn't as necessary as the media would lead us to believe? Or am I just not seeing it correctly? This is a really complicated question. I hate to be that guy. Everything's got a lot of details. But uh, it turns out that um, the Spanish flu was, was a form of influenza. And yeah. this is a coronavirus. And our bodies through, you know, life has been fighting with viruses, if you want to look at it that way, or, or coexisting for a long time. And so really elegant strategies have been worked out. And for whatever reason, through history and evolutionary history, our bodies decided that they were going to fight coronaviruses for the most part with a T cell immunity, which uh, I've talked about a lot because it's very different from the B cell, which is what they're trying to do with these vaccines is, is get your immune system up so that it recognizes a foreign antigen. You make antibodies against it. That's one way to do it. The other way is you have these cells which recognize foreign invaders. So it makes it more complicated because here's what we know. We know that some people, when they get this thing, are completely asymptomatic. Nothing ever happens to them, but we can detect that they were exposed because their T cells are all activated. So they have this immunity that's not coming through the same path as the vaccine. The second thing that our bodies have decided to do with coronaviruses is when they do mount what the vaccine is giving us, which is an antibody response, it doesn't hold on to it. So the antibody response goes away and it goes away fairly quickly. So we don't know what that means yet. It might mean that we're on a constant every six months, you're just getting revaccinated with this thing. We, we don't know yet because we don't have enough time and data on this. So I hate to be complicated about this, but you know, the idea that you give everybody a vaccine once, we achieve this thing called herd immunity, and this thing goes away more or less like the Spanish flu did. I'm not sure that's how this is going to work out with this virus because it's a coronavirus and our bodies just deal with it very differently. So we, 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 I hate to be this way, but we just don't know. Would we have gotten to herd immunity without a vaccine? Yes, of course we would. Um, it, it, that'll always happen. Uh, it's, but it's kind of like saying, did we ever get to herd immunity with the common cold, which are different variants of the coronavirus and other things, but of the coronaviruses that give us what we call the common cold, um, uh, you, never, you never really totally achieve full herd immunity to those because our, an, our, our immune response wanes over time. So they come around, they come around and you know all of that. So herd immunity would always mean it's endemic. There's a certain amount of it. It spikes a little bit, but the spikes aren't as bad as that first time. So we had a really bad first wave in places where it just sort of took us by surprise. Let's say New York would be an example. Right. I would be very surprised if we ever saw a wave like that again, but we could have a second wave, but it would be less. And this is all without the idea that maybe somehow this virus mutates and you know, has, a, has a second life as a, in a different sort of a form. But as it's configured with this virus is what we know about it. My belief is your first wave is the worst one. You do have these so-called second waves that come through, but, but they haven't, like we see this in London, we see this in, in Spain, we see this in, in Italy, places that had a really bad first wave. They're having a second wave, but they're not nearly as, as pronounced as the first wave. And are, are they less severe from a standpoint of the number of people that get infected, or are they less severe with the cases themselves? Or both? I think I can answer B. Uh, the, the cases themselves are less severe because we do have more effective treatments for them in the hospital setting. We know to use okay. steroids and stuff. But the first part, I can't answer because we keep changing the testing protocol. So, so we're, we're running tests now that, that come up with a lot of cases, but these cases that are being detected are not epidemiologically relevant or clinically relevant because it's a little wonky again, but, but they run these tests 
and, and they're, they're tests where they're exponentially amplifying the signal. And we right. know that if you do that above what's called 35 cycles, that anything above that, it, people aren't transmissive, they aren't sick, maybe it's old fragments. We don't know, but, but for the most part, you can ignore readings above 35 from a, mm. from a public health standpoint. And in the United States, as long as you know, we're running tests at 40 cycles, 45, 42, it's kind of up to the states, but you have to run a minimum of 38 for it to be a reasonable test according to the FDA. So, so when we test these things, we get these things back that sound, they're calling them cases, George, they're not cases. They're detected right. SARS-CoV-2 virus particles. Um, we don't know if it's a live virus, an inactivated one, old fragments, we don't know. But a case, to be clear, I hate to be pedantic, a case should be somebody who has symptoms that require medical attention. That's what it used to mean. We don't know what it means anymore. So I wish I could tell you where we are in this story, but we have bad data and you can't run good analyses on bad data. Right, right. Okay, so we got a vaccine coming out. Uh, as a professional, are you going to take it? Why or why not? No, I'm going to I'm going to sit back and wait and watch. Fortunately, I have that luxury. I, I'm, you know, we're talking from my, my little hidey hole in Western Massachusetts. I live on a, on a fairly you know extensive piece of land, and, and I don't. And my business allows me not to have a lot of contact uh, with the public. But if I was going to be in a hospital setting, I'm a bus driver, I'm an airline pilot, or or my company requires me to have it, I have a very different decision to make. So I'm speaking right. from a point of privilege, and that privilege allows me to say I'd rather wait. And this is actually a very scientific discussion because first, we've never had an mRNA vaccine before. So it's a whole new technology and platform. My experience in, in, as a scientist is it never works quite like you think. Nature is pretty clever and complex. And sometimes you have to just run the experiment and watch what happens because complex systems have emergent behaviors. They don't have predictable behaviors. Right. So watch for what emerges. Right. That's just how it works. The second thing is they really cut a lot of corners on this. I know they're saying that they didn't, but but they had to, right? Um, so here's a study they haven't run. Hey, we put this into primates, monkeys, and we let them have it for a year, and then we expose them to various uh, variants of this virus and regular cold viruses to see what happens. That would be a normal thing that would happen in a typical vaccine development. We didn't have time or the luxury of that, so it didn't get done. Right. Um, and and it may be the, the the best thing ever. This mRNA vaccine technology could be the greatest thing that ever happened since the first smallpox jab from the cowpox that proved the principle back in the 1800s. Right? That's possible. And it, it could be that we're going to learn some things. So I know a lot of professional virologists, immunologists, people who've all told me personally that they're just going to wait and watch too. And we're starting to see some stories like that sneak out, right? You know, they, they want to pretend as if Everybody just wants this right away. But we're finding out that a lot of people who are in the healthcare profession uh, are saying, I'd like to wait too. It's about a 50, 60 percent uh, uh, mark of people who are in that profession are going, mm, I don't know. And they have the same concerns I do, which is, uh, and this would have been best if, if the companies involved in these things had been very forthcoming with their data, I would feel differently. Here's an example. Uh, the, the Pfizer uh, BioNTech uh, one that they just came out with, I, I looked through all this voluminous data they put out, and they broke down uh, the groups into under 55 and over 55. And the mm -hmm. doctors I talked to are like, that's not, we have computers, you can do this by, by five-year bands or 10-year bands at most, and that would be the normal way to present this because over 55 is meaningless. What does it mean to give it to an 85-year-old is different from 75, 60? Right. But they just sort of said over 55. Um, so the the to people who study these things, there's a reason when a company groups things in that way, and it's because they thought it looked better when they grouped it that way. So, so it's just, if they really wanted to create a lot of comfort for people like me who like data, they would have broken the data out in the usual way. And then we could have looked at big tables and said, is there any difference by age? Oh, no, great. But the fact that they grouped it like that is not confidence inspiring. And, mm. you know, this is just being, uh, this isn't, this is just how the world works, right? Companies have an interest in, look, 90% of every study that's ever been run by a, a pharma company that got put into JAMA or uh, you know, Lancet or anything like that, 90% of them showed that their, that their experiments worked and that their drugs did what they said they were gonna do. How is that possible? You would think every so often, law of random averages, things wouldn't quite go your way. 
And, and, and it's really funny. If, if competitor A tests their stuff against competitor B, their trials win and vice versa. Um, right. it, it's just, it just tells you that this thing, this is just humans. It's, it, it's the law of incentives. You know, as Charlie Munger, Buffett's right-hand man said, you show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. I'm a huge believer in that. And I think that means that the bar is even higher for people who want to come to a rush protocol, not lower because we're in such a hurry. Yeah. I was listening to another doctor from Stanford on Tom Woods podcast the other day. And he said that he was basically suggesting to uh, patients that based on their age, uh, you know, again, if you're under 50 years old, eh, you might want to think twice about it because the vaccine might have more downside than you actually getting the, the virus you're trying to protect yourself against. But if you're over a certain age group or you're 400 pounds or you're you know diabetic or you have one of these high risk, uh, you're in one of these high risk categories, then you, know, you, you might want to think about it. That's kind of how he broke it down. It made a lot of sense.